Uh, I'm going to share uh, one of the stories from my laboratory. Uh, just in general, uh, we're interested in how viruses and cells interact. And uh, so sometimes when looking at my CV, you think that I just study whatever comes to mind. But that's not quite true. Uh, we're usually following viruses along the way uh, because viruses are so brilliant in their own way that they have found ways to exploit our cellular pathways for their own uh, nefarious purposes. Is nefarious a word in Italian, too? Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> cattivo, right? <laughs> so, but very cattivo. Anyway, so, uh, so uh, we are very interested in, in how viruses do that. So we're interested in viruses for a number of reasons. One is just because they're interesting. Two is we're looking for therapies for them. And three is we're interested in how they interact with cells. And as I was mentioning, <clears throat> because that can tell us a lot about our own human cell biology which then leads to adventures sometimes in uh, oncogenesis and uh, autoimmunity also. But today I'm going to talk about something which is sort of typical for my lab. If you'd told me 10 years ago I was going to be presenting this story to you, I would have said, oh, never. We'd never be interested in that. But it turns out we were. Uh, we, we had a series of opportunities that came our way. And for younger scientists, you probably have started to realize that a lot of what drives you are opportunities. Interesting projects present themselves. Either your mentor or, in my case, your mentee becomes very interested in something, and then you do. So, um, so that's uh, such a story I'm going to tell you today. And it uh, revolves around uh, banana lectin. Uh, for those of you who don't think about this topic, so, and for those of you who do, I'm sorry. I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence. But lectins are simply sugar-binding proteins, just to get that out of the way. So a lectin is a sugar-binding protein. They've been used a lot in biology for stimulating T cells, for example. A lot of you will, if you study T cells, you're using lectins to stimulate your T cells, but you're probably not thinking about what they actually are. And they are sugar-binding proteins. So uh, we got interested in a specific sugar-binding protein from bananas called Banlec. And we got interested in it because I had a wonderful graduate student, Michael Swanson. And Mike uh, was not so happy with the project he was working on. And uh, then Erwin uh, uh, Goldstein, who's a world authority on lectins and glycobiology at Michigan, came to us and said, well, we have this banana lectin that we think might be active against HIV. Do you want to try it? Now, before I go into this long and detailed story, I want to tell you that we are not the first group to think about using lectins as antiviral agents. Other groups have thought about this for a long time. What we are the first group to do, and what I'm going to show you, is that we're the first group to molecularly engineer a lectin to make it better for therapeutics, and showing that we can actually separate two distinct functions of a lectin through targeted molecular engineering I'll show you what, what happened to the molecule, uh, and I'll then show you how we can use it as an antiviral agent. What I won't be able to show you, because it's still ongoing research, is what it actually does to this, what, which, what are the receptors on the cell it recognizes. I hope we're going to be able, I'll be able to tell you that in a few years. Okay, so uh, I should just point out that I have started a company to try to commercialize this uh, form of banana lectin. Uh, so far, I'm the one and only uh, unpaid employee. So far, the money has only been paid by me to the state of Delaware, where my uh, company is incorporated. So uh, I don't really have too much in the way of uh, financial. Uh, 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 unfortunately, I don't have much to declare financially. Now, um, the way we originally got into this, when we began thinking about banana lectin, as being an anti-HIV agent was we thought that perhaps it could be used as a vaginal microbicide to prevent HIV transmission, sexual HIV transmission. And at the time we got, and as you'll see, we've sort of moved away from that area. But at the time we got into it, we were, uh, this was a sort of a hot topic. Eventually, of course, tenofovir came out as being a good preventive agent at, at, at first. Uh, when used as a gel, then it didn't look so good. And now, anyway, if you really want to prevent the spread of HIV, you should probably give people oral antiretroviral drugs. Uh, 
uh, either people who have HIV, for sure, those people, and even some of their partners. So the whole idea of using a vaginal microbicide, while not dead and certainly still of interest, has sort of faded a little bit, at least in our interest. Now, the original idea is that HIV, uh, so we're, we're, we're gonna, as we go through the talk, you're going to see that we're using this modified banana lectin to, against a number of different viruses. And they all have one thing in common. They have a lot of mannose sugar on their surfaces because the banana lectin recognizes mannose. And the idea is, throughout the talk, is that the lectin is going to bind to the sugars on the virus. And then the virus itself, because it needs those sugars on its envelope to get in or fuse, to either bind or fuse and get into a cell, that that activity is going to be blocked by the lectin. So thinking about that, HIV is an incredibly glycosylated uh, virus. GP120, its envelope protein, when you run a Western blot, about half of its molecular weight is sugar, mannose. So we wondered uh, whether we can target the, uh, the glycan uh, shield. Uh, we perhaps can't be quite as beautiful in our work as Donatello, but uh, uh, we use them as an inspiration. Uh, so can we t how could we target the glycan shield? Through lectins. And as I've just told you, lectins are sugar-binding proteins. They're found in plants and animals. And some of them can recognize the glycosylated structures on HIV and other uh, uh, viruses. And I mentioned this before. There's a list of, of, of uh, lectins that people have used in this regard. Probably the most significant one, potentially clinically, is Griffison, although uh, it's a little hard to follow for us what's going on with Griffison presently in its development as a drug. So the one we have focused on is Banlec. And uh, it's no coincidence, as I mentioned, my colleague Erwin Goldstein is one of the people who's done the major work on Banlec. So Banlec is found in the ripened fruit of the bananas. Uh, you can actually go to the grocery store, buy a bunch of bananas, mush them up, and purify the uh, lectin. It exists as a dimer, uh, and the molecular weight of each monomer is uh, uh, 15 uh, kD, approximately. And it can bind to high mannose structures. So this was all known, and actually the original crystal structure uh, was obtained uh, in uh, the laboratory of my collaborator at Michigan, Jeannie Stuckey, in 2005. So a long time before I got interested in this topic, there was to interest in banana lectin at University of Michigan. So uh, I don't want to go through all sorts of old data, so just to point out, as of 2010, where we stood, we had a paper in Journal of Biological Chemistry uh, written by Mike Swanson showing that indeed, as predicted, no big surprise, banana lectin could inhibit HIV replication. It blocked primarily the entry of the virus, but a little bit the fusion of the virus to the uh, cell. And uh, it compared favorably to other drugs and lectins in terms of its potency, and did indeed bind to the GP120 envelope protein, just as we might have predicted. So, I thought the paper was quite nice. I was very happy for Mike. I was very happy for us. But I didn't think it would really cause much commotion in the world. Uh, but I was wrong. It turned out, um, probably due to the fact that we were talking about sex, HIV, vaginal microbicides, the world pre and bananas, the world press loved this, this paper. Uh, and we were quoted everywhere. Uh, often misquoted. Uh, for example, there was a newspaper in, uh, in Britain that basically implied that people should now throw their antiretroviral drugs into the Thames and just eat bananas instead. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was actually on the BBC, uh, which has a program where uh, people explain why the press was wrong about findings, and I was explaining how this was not what we had in mind. <laughs> and uh, I, was, uh, I got a call from a very famous playwright who's uh, famously infected with HIV, wanting to know whether he should be eating bananas. Uh, I said, don't bother. He was relieved because he doesn't like bananas. So uh, it all worked out well. My favorite, however, uh, was probably uh, this. Uh, so it turns out that the uh, magazine Esquire uh, in the United States has an article every month called This Month in Intercourse. 
And we were quoted in this month in intercourse. You can see University of Michigan medical scientists. They didn't name us by name. But I think that this is probably the only time you'll be seeing our work next to pictures of Angelina Jolie. So I was uh, extremely happy about this. However, in spite of all this fun, uh, this was not a very promising therapeutic agent at the time. And the reason is because banana lectin, as it comes out of the banana, is mitogenic. That's why T cell biologists love to use it, because it turns on T cells. But you can imagine in a vaginal microbicide, you don't want a lot of unwanted inflammation. Or as we eventually came to view this as perhaps something we could use for treating viruses in a systemic manner, we also didn't want a lot of inflammation there. So the question was, can we reduce mitogenetic, uh, mitogenic activity without eliminating the anti-HIV activity? And this sounds straightforward, but really no one had ever separated two functions of electin through targeted engineering before. So it was actually uh, took the bravery of my former student, Mike Swanson, to do this. So I'm going to tell the story, like, you know, again, for the young people in the audience, most stories, once they get to the the, the talk stage sound like this, right? That uh, this is the way the answer was transmitted uh, from uh, God straight to Mike Swanson. Uh, but in fact, of course, there was a lot of trial and error that went into this. But I'll tell you the story as if we had the brilliant idea right away. So, um, well, there was one fairly brilliant idea fairly early on by Mike, uh, which was that realizing that banana lectin has a structure, almost all of it is made up of what are called three Greek key structures. Greek keys are the structures that are, you'll see pictures of here. And two of the Greek keys, Greek key one and two, were known already through the crystal structure to contact the mannose and be vital for binding the mannose. Uh, and indeed, when Mike would go in and make mutations of the first and second Greek key, we would lose all of the mitogenicity, but unfortunately, we would also lose all of the antiviral activity. But there's a third Greek key that in the crystal structure uh, more or less like kisses the banos. So it was thought perhaps that this was involved in fine tuning uh, the molecular function of a lectin. And indeed, that's what turned out to be the case, as you'll see uh, in the subsequent slides. So, uh, sorry. So, let me go back for a second. So if you can see at the top, there's this histidine 84. And uh, from now on, I'm going to be showing you a special form of the banana lectin. It's called H84T. So the histidine at position 84 has been changed to a 3 and 8. So one simple mutation, although as I'll show you later, uh, the mutagenesis strategy is actually fairly complicated. But here, I'm going to show you that. So what, did we, what happened when, we, when Mike mutated this site? It turns out that, uh, sure enough, uh, we lose mitogenicity as measured by uh, T cell activation. Uh, and this is using BRDU uh, incorporation. Here, and this is work, these next two figures are actually done by Dominique Scholz in uh, Belgium in, in Leuven, a place frequented by at least some of your faculty. Uh, and uh, what you can see is that here, the CD69 activation marker is much, much less activated by H84T BANLEC as compared to wild-type BANLEC. And similarly, when we looked at a bunch of different donors and tried to stimulate their peripheral blood lymphocytes, uh, with each or either H84T BANLEC or with wild-type BANLEC, you can see that there's much less stimulation with the mutant. You might not be able to see it very well. This is a lot of data packed into one slide, but uh, it's published. So uh, Now, of course, I wouldn't be showing you this if the mutant had also lost anti-HIV activity, but it did not. So again, working with Dominique, we were able to show that uh, H84T BANLEC was just as effective against almost all strains of HIV as was the wild type. And in fact, with Dominique, uh, we were able to test not only laboratory strains, but also this series of clinical strains in group M and even the outlier group and HIV2, a virus I used to study quite extensively in my laboratory. And it worked uh, much better than uh, the 2G12 monoclonal antibody, which is sort of the classic uh, neutralizing monoclonal antibody. So 
Now, at this point, we had already begun to think of other viruses other than HIV we could attack. The reason is, as probably most of you know, there are 35 or so approved agents for HIV already. And so while HIV continues to be a very important public health problem, the main problem is not really developing new antiviral agents. It's distributing them and ultimately, hopefully, getting a vaccine. So we began to think, could we use this same strategy to target multiple other viruses for which there are very few agents available? Influenza immediately sprang to mind. There is Tamiflu, which is an effective agent, but it's only one, and it has uh, multiple drawbacks. So we then, this is using a pseudotype virus. This is work done by Steve King in my lab. And what you can see is that H84T was very effective against the infamous 1918 flu, the one that killed many millions of people. Uh, in addition, it was highly active against uh, avian flu, one of the types of flu we're very concerned about now causing trouble. And uh, I won't show you all the data, but using actually wild-type flu, this is against pseudotyped flu, but using wild-type flu, uh, collaborators of ours at Utah State, uh, Don Smee and uh, uh, in particular, we're able to show that H84T Banlec was effective against essentially all strains of influenza tested in tissue culture. So A, B, Tamiflu resistant, multiple types of, of influenza. But uh, more remarkably, we wanted to take a look in vivo. Now we'd already seen that you could actually put H84T uh, ban like in, uh, vaginally in a mouse and prevent HIV transmission. But here we wanted to take a look at influenza. And as you can see, and in this case, I'm going to show you later other ways of administering Banlec. But in this case, we're actually putting Banlec into the nose of the mouse four hours after you uh, infect them with influenza. And what you can see is that it's highly effective at preventing death. And that's the uh, nice thing about the mouse model. The endpoint is death, so there's no disputing uh, <laughs> whether it was effective or not. And it was about 80% effective when given that way. So H84T Banlec is highly effective actually in vivo, not just in tissue culture. So um, the next uh, part here, I want to talk to you about the mechanism. And when I'm talking about the mechanism here, I'm talking about what is different between H84T Banlec and wild-type Banlec. Why is H84T no longer mitogenic but still able to kill viruses? And let me give you the sort of the punchline a little bit so that you can think about this as we go through. So what we think is going on is H84T Banlec is not, no longer able to cross-link. So if you think about mitogenicity, you need to cross-link classically two different molecules on the surface of a cell in order to drive T cell activation. But if you were just trying to inactivate a virus, you would just need to bind to a single molecule on the virus, which would be its envelope, and then it could no longer enter. So what I'm going to show you is that it looks like what H84T Banlec is like is that it is not able to cross-link but still, of course, can bind to single elements uh, on a virus. So that'll be the punchline, but let me show you the data. So uh, this is done, again, uh, in collaboration with Erwin Goldstein's laboratory. When we looked at uh, this, uh, um, the KAs, which would indicate sort of just the ability to bind, what we find is that wild-type, and these are simple sugars, and what we see is that wild-type band like an H84T bind more or less the same to these simple sugars. But when we looked at the old-fashioned hemagglutination test, right, so this is looking at whether you can actually agglutinate a red cell using the lectin, we find that there's a marked difference, a very marked difference. So H84T is much less able to agglutinate a red cell, again, implying that it's probably not able to bind to multiple receptors on the surface of a cell. And uh, we, won't, uh, we won't go through this one in great length, uh, but this is work done in collaboration with Hans Joachim Gabius in uh, Munich, uh, a world authority on glycobiology. And what we're able to show using a whole series of what are called glycoclusters and then also looking on the surface of cells 
is that indeed H84T was much less able to bind to complex sugars than was uh, wild type. And similarly, we see the same thing on the surface of a cell. So again, pointing out that we just don't get the same sort of robust binding to complex carbohydrates uh, with the mutant as we do with the wild type. Uh, one slightly disappointing thing is that we're still not exactly sure which sh complex array of sugars is being as well recognized uh, or less well recognized by H84T as compared to wild type. And that's an, uh, an object of ongoing research in the lab. Because we'd really like to know wi why are T cells, you know, what is it about the recognition of specific molecules on a T cell that, uh, that uh, is leading to this differential in mitogenicity. So, however, at the atomic level, when looking at the, um, at the, uh, uh, the differences between H84T and wild type, we have a very good understanding of what's going on between the differentiates the two molecules. And this is crystallography work done uh, with uh, Jeannie Stuckey's lab. What you can see is when we first, uh, so we had good and bad luck when we started out doing crystallography. The good news was, honest to God, it took one week, sorry, two weeks after my phone call to Jeannie to ask her if she wanted to collaborate before we actually had crystal structure. Two weeks, all time record. However, the problem was when we first looked at the crystal structure of wild type and H84T ban, like they looked awfully similar. We thought, oh my God, you know, what's going on here? But then it turns out, now this is a little bit with the, uh, the benefit of retrospective analysis, but it turns out that the key difference between the molecules is right here uh, between H84 and, you know, the histidine 84, the one we're mutating, and the Y83, the tyrosine 83 below it. And what you can see is that there is this, uh, this stacking, what's called pi pi stacking, of these two aromatic amino acids. And what I'm going to show you subsequently, uh, based on our NMR work, uh, is that if you don't have this pi pi stacking, you don't get mitogenicity. So this is what we like to call the mitogenic wall. So we've actually narrowed down to this exact, not, it's not surprising, of course, that the H84 is, is important because that's what's been mutated. But as I'll show you, it's that particular structure that mediates this mitogenicity. And the way we've ascertained that uh, is through extensive NMR studies. The NMR is done by my, with my major uh, and most important collaborator on this project, Hashim Al Hashimi, who's a uh, absolutely brilliant uh, NMR uh, chemist uh, who um, typically works more on DNA and RNA, and every few years redefines the uh, dynamic nature of, uh, of uh, the molecular aspects of DNA and RNA. But fortunately, Hashim also likes uh, 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 lactins. So we uh, were able to work with him on this extensively. And what we're able to show essentially is that when you look by solution NMR, there's a, uh, and then ultimately also he, his laboratory did uh, molecular dynamic modeling, what you can find is that there's a lot more dynamism in, H80, in, in, the, uh, in the third Greek key when you introduce this uh, H84T mutation. So there's a, it's a much more dynamic structure uh, than it was if you don't make the mutation. And uh, there's something probably the most important thing that comes out, and pardon me, this is sort of a complex story to tell in one slide, but I'll tell you basically what we found. So by this point, uh, Dan Boudreau and Luik uh, Salmon had uh, entered the picture. Dan, uh, a postdoctoral fellow who was involved in exploring BANLEC in general, and uh, Loic, who was an NMR, who was an NMR guy who was working with uh, Hashem. And what they were able to show is this. Dan made 10 different mutations in histidine 84. And what he found was any time that he introduced a mutation that led to lack of pi pi stacking, so you no longer had two aromatic amino acids, you lost mitogenicity. And then, any time you maintain the pi pi stacking, no matter what the mutation was, you now still had mitogenicity. Uh, and that many of the mutations where you lost 
mitogenicity, predictably you also lost antiviral activity. But fortunately with H84T, you were able to maintain the antiviral activity while losing the mitogenicity. And this could be seen beautifully by NMR that you could actually correlate mitogenicity with NMR uh, picture. Highly unusual finding. And um, in particular, for example, the best example of this was uh, A86. So even though 86 and 84 sound like they're nearby, right, 84, 86, they're actually on the other side of each other on the, um, on the third Greek key. So changes in 86 are not trivial changes that are made just because you happen to have, have modified 84 because they're the opposite side of the, third, of the third Greek key. And what you can see is that there's this almost perfect alignment between, well, it's probably hard to see, but if you were able to uh, evaluate NMR carefully, what you would see is that uh, 86 correlates perfectly with mitogenicity. So you could actually give us a mutation, you could give us a mutant of uh, the third Greek key, and by NMR we could tell you, or Hashem could tell you, whether it's mitogenic or not. So really a very, very fine correlation between atomic level structure and mitogenicity. Now, most of us uh, find uh, a lot of our scientific lives resemble this uh, painting. And you may think that this painting is the Sacrifice of Isaac by Caravaggio. But in fact, this is actually a photograph. And uh, this guy with the knife is not actually Abraham, but he's actually uh, an editor of a major scientific journal. And the guy having his, the knife held to his throat is me or somebody in my laboratory. So this is how we often feel like we go through our scientific life. However, uh, in this story had a happier ending because it uh, did get published in Cell uh, last year. And uh, essentially, uh, because of the, I think, the breadth of the story, and essentially we presented <coughs> this model, uh, which I've been talking to you about, but let me explain uh, one more time for clarity now that you have a, a drawing. <coughs> and basically what we think is happening is this. When we have the mitogenic uh, 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 structure, the pro-mitogenic structure, the mitogenic wall, <coughs> which is which 83 and 84 are stacked, what happens is it protects the two sugar binding uh, pockets. Therefore, we bind, uh, the, the lectin is predisposed to bind to two distinct sugars that are separated in space, i.e. they're on different uh, molecules on the surface of the, the, of the cell. Therefore, something like mitogenicity that requires sampling of two different molecules that are on a cell uh, would be preserved, How, as, would, as would sugar binding on a, on a virus. However, when we lose the mitogenic wall, we get sort of the caving in of the, uh, the sugar binding pocket on this side. And so the molecule now wants to sample only one sugar, i.e. the sugar that's found on a virus, but it's no longer going to be able to cross-link. So, uh, so that is our, uh, our hypothesis going forward. And so as I mentioned, this is the first demonstration that mitogenicity can be uncoupled from antiviral activity. There's a bimolecular switch that we've identified on the atomic level. Uh, and it suggests, and I'm gonna show you now some data, that H84T BANLEC could be a very useful agent, perhaps clinically, uh, as an antiviral agent because it, it's broad spectrum. It works against HIV, it works against uh, flu, and I didn't go through all the data that we've generated with Charlie Rice showing that it's highly effective against every possible strain of hepatitis C virus also. And sort of more fundamentally, what we like to think this work shows is that lectins can be engineered for therapeutic purposes, for antiviral activity, for other areas where they're being used, for example, in cancer therapy. Uh, and uh, people have even been interested in sort of the opposite direction of actually the pro-mitogenic activity perhaps being used to promote the growth of bone marrow in the setting of transplantation. So um, finally, of course, this could be used to decipher the sugar code. As you guys, I'm, I'm sure know, in addition to nucleic acids and proteins, 
Uh, sugars are a brilliant way for the body to transmit uh, information because they're so complex and they can be altered in very subtle ways and have very which can lead to very fundamental differences in biology as we slightly illustrate here. This, this is just, you know, sort of the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more really fine biology that uh, many groups are doing trying to understand how sugars are important. Now, um, what about using our H84? Let me switch now to a much more applied sort of discussion, which is, can we actually use H84 T. Banlec as a therapeutic agent in the setting of influenza and other important infections? In order to do so, we probably have to be able to administer it systemically. And as some of you may know, there really is no protein therapy presently being used in that setting. Usually when we give proteins therapeutically, we're replacing things that are missing, insulin or factor VIII. Um, probably the only thing I can think of that's analogous is there's a peptide that's used against HIV. But generally using uh, proteins as therapeutic agents, especially as antivirals, is not something people are doing. So we're, um, we're fighting, uh, as I like to say in English, we're fighting City Hall on this one. But we think we have some very interesting results that might suggest that this might, be, might happen. The first thing, this was done by Maureen Legender, my longtime research associate, was to administer H84 T. Banlec to a mouse and then see what happens. Does it get taken up in tissues? And it does. So it goes to the lung, liver, and spleen primarily, and it stays there for a week or two. So we can give H84 T. Banlec to a mouse. It gets taken up in the tissues. And just to tell you uh, up front, so far, uh, well, certainly we can give a mouse too much Banlec and see toxicity, but at the levels we need to fight against viruses, it's extremely well tolerated, which I'll show you more in a little while. So uh, meanwhile, working with uh, TSRL, who's a biotech company in, uh, in, uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I am, uh, especially uh, uh, Ilke Lipke, uh, we've been able to develop a, uh, an ELISA to measure BANLEC. And what you can see here is that uh, given in three different doses, BANLEC has a very, very long serum half-life, about 80 hours. So this implies, uh, although we've done it multiple ways, as I'll show you in a minute, that we might be able to give BANLEC once or maybe twice, and, use, and that would be enough to treat uh, an infection such as influenza. Oh, uh, I forgot to mention, we, uh, the data is so new that I don't even have it here, but the um, half-life and concentrations in the lungs, which are the, our, our first target therapeutically, are even much uh, higher than this. So we get very high levels in the lung when we administer BANLEC um, systemically, i.e. intraperitoneally or intravenously. Now, I've been implying throughout the talk that uh, by changing H80, by making H84 T. Banlec, this, uh, this um, mutation that we've made makes the molecule safer. And actually, we published the whole long paper showing that we lost metagenicity, but we hadn't actually shown a head-to-head -head comparison yet between a mouse who's gotten H84 T. Banlec or wild-type BANLEC. We just assumed it would be safer because it would be less mitogenic. And in a, so now we've actually put this to the test by giving mice three different types of um, H80, uh, uh, BANLEC. Wild-type H80, wild BANLEC, H84T BANLEC, and something called D133G. This is a control mutant we've used in a number of experiments where we mutate one of the first, to the second Greek key so as I mentioned before, that's known to eliminate both antiviral activity and mitogenicity. And what you can see is when we give uh, only the wild type, but not the two non-mitogenic versions of H80 of, of uh, BANLEC, we get this injection site reaction. So in other words, when you give the regular ba banana lectin to a mouse, it gets a big reaction on its skin, something you wouldn't want clinically. So but not so when we have the H84 T BANLEC, no skin reaction. Other side effects are similar. When you give H80 wild-type BANLEC, 
you also see uh, the appearance change of the mouse. They get their, their little hairs stand up on edge for a number of days. That doesn't happen with the H84T Banlec. And finally, we actually get uh, weight loss. So if you give wild-type Banlec to a mouse, it loses weight. They get, gain the weight ba back later, but that doesn't happen with H84T Banlec either. So our assumption that by losing metagenicity, we'd make a safer molecule, fortunately, has turned out to actually be true. But what about the efficacy of H84T Banlec as an antiviral agent? Obviously, I wouldn't be telling you this whole story if it didn't work. And it does work. So uh, I'm going to focus on two viruses, especially influenza. But also, I want to just tell you a little bit about it. We've been working on Ebola virus also, not in my laboratory. It's still safe to come visit my laboratory. We're not actually doing the Ebola there. Uh, this is with collaborators again. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll uh, go through, I'll tell you all, all my various collaborators at the end. Uh, but uh, what we've been able to see here, this is with collaborators at NIH, uh, is that, interestingly enough, we had already seen that Ebola worked in, uh, sorry, H84T Banlec was effective against Ebola in tissue culture, but it also works in mice. So this is giving it before the challenge. We're fairly early on in these experiments. And what you can see is that we can prevent 50 or 60% of the death that can occur with Ebola when we give Banlec. So the stuff works against this very deadly virus in tissue culture. And then our most, probably the, the virus we'd most like to target is influenza. Uh, and where we've seen, uh, where we've had really quite a lot of success. So in this case that you're seeing here, we're giving the, again, we're giving um, the H84T Banlex systemically, so intraperitoneally, which in a mouse is like intravenously. And here we're giving it every five days uh, after challenge, starting four hours after infection. And what you can see is that uh, when we give uh, five milligrams per kilogram, we get 100% survival. When we give none, almost all the mice die. And in these medium doses, uh, we get better survival, but not as well as at five milligrams per kilogram. Now, uh, as you probably understood from what I was showing before about the pharmacokinetics, it looks like we might be able to do all of this by giving a one-dose therapy also. But that's still ongoing. Two other things that don't come out from this slide, because uh, I haven't shown them, are that here we're treating at, uh, at four hours after a uh, virus challenge. But I'm happy to report that what we see now is that we can treat as long as 72 hours after viral challenge and still see almost complete survival of all the mice. So we don't have to treat right away. We can actually simulate a clinical situation where we're treating three days later and we're still getting survival. And the other thing, uh, which I don't have a picture of yet, uh, but we've done with uh, Scott Evans at uh, MD Anderson in Houston, is it turns out that you can actually use an inhaled form of Banlec, and it works. So what Scott does is he studies toll-like receptor agonists to treat um, viral infections. And he, he can actually, he has an apparatus where the mice can actually inhale the toll-like receptor agonist. And what Scott has been seeing using our H84T Banlec is his approach and ours synergize. So it looks like in addition to giving this systemically, i.e. through intravenously, ultimately in patients, we might be able to make an inhaled form. So, uh, and again, the stuff is completely well tolerated. We see no side effects. And we've also looked at uh, liver function, kidney function, uh, and uh, white blood cells, hematocrit, platelets, no problems. Now, one, speaking of potential problems with this sort of therapy, when we first started talking about this, we got a lot of, um, we had some skeptics who said, oh, if you give this stuff now and then you give it later, either you'll cause a lot of harm to the animals due to immunogenicity, and as I mentioned, that, that has not happened, and we've tried this many, many ways. But the other question that people said was, well, if you give this now and then you give it a month later, meanwhile, the uh, animals will, or ultimately people, will develop antibodies. And the antibodies will destroy the banana lectin and you won't be able to use it. 
So that was not true. Well, it was true that the animals do develop antibodies. The antibodies don't do anything. Because here is a picture of what happens when we treat uh, uh, animals with H84T Banlec. We wait a month, and then we challenge them with influenza. And then we treat them again with H84T Banlec. And as you can see, they all still survive. So the antibody, whatever antibodies they develop are not destroying the H84T Banlec. So Immuno, so there is an immune response. They do develop antibodies. The antibodies don't harm the animals in any way that we can see, and we've tried to look many, many ways. And in addition to that, the antibodies don't destroy the metanolactin. So this doesn't have to be like a one-time treatment. So just to summarize, we've created a broad-spectrum antiviral agent through uh, in hopefully intelligently designed molecular engineering of a banana lectin. And it's very effective against influenza and also hepatitis C and Ebola when given systemically in the mouse model. I didn't have time to show you, but some work we've done, per, particularly with Jasper Chan uh, in uh, Hong Kong, has demonstrated that H84T is very effective against SARS and MERS in tissue culture. So the implication would be clinically that we would be able to, if we had a patient who was sick who came into an emergency room, we had a viral pneumonia and we didn't know what the cause was, we might be able to just empirically treat them with H84T Banlec until we found what the cause was. This is similar to what we do all the time with antibiotics. Somebody comes in with a bacterial pneumonia and we treat them empirically because we don't know what the agent is. We hope we're going to be able to do that with Banlec, but of course much work remains before we can actually uh, do that. So, uh, as you can probably guess, not all of this work was done in my own laboratory <laughs> because it's a uh, very multidisciplinary uh, project. And uh, the nice thing about this project is we've had a lot of good fortune with uh, attracting collaborators. People like it and uh, they've worked with us extensively. So let me just go through, I've mentioned Mike Swanson. Mike actually did the original, is really was the inventor of H84T Banlec in my laboratory. Then he went on to do a postdoc uh, uh, at UNC with uh, Victor Garcia. And uh, it was in Victor's lab where he actually showed that uh, H84T could block vaginal transmission of HIV. Uh, Dan Boudreau uh, was a postdoc with me and with Hashim al Hashimi. Uh, and Dan was the one who really uh, led the charge to make sure that we could purify uh, Banlec and actually get uh, NMR and crystal structure, as well as making all those mutants at the uh, histidine 84 position. Uh, amusingly, Dan then now went to, to he's a, has a position as a scientist with the Army, and uh, he was actually, at one point or another, when there was a big Ebola outbreak, he was in West Africa with uh, none other than Gene Olinger, our other collaborator, uh, who does the uh, banana lectin work with uh, with uh, Ebola, uh, and Lisa DeWald also at NIH. So Lisa and Jean are the Ebola collaborators uh, at this point. Um, other really key people uh, at, in the initial studies, Hashim al Hashimi, I mentioned, my uh, terrific uh, collaborator uh, and friend on the uh, structural, bio structural biology, and Luis Salmon, who was a very uh, fine uh, postdoc with Hashim. And uh, Jeet also worked uh, extensively on this project when he was in Hashem's lab. Yi is the guy who did the uh, uh, dynamic modeling, the molecular dynamic modeling. Uh, other people I mentioned, Maureen Legender, my uh, research associate, who has done a lot of the animal work with banana lectin. And she's worked a lot with Steve King, who's now sort of leading this project in my uh, laboratory. Uh, Mark Kaplan is an infectious diseases doctor who, quote, retired to, my, to Ann Arbor 10 years ago plus uh, to be near his children and grandchildren. But it turns out Mark has more energy than any 20-year-old. So uh, he's been, uh, uh, was the guy who originally suggested we start thinking about H84T Banlec uh, as, a, uh, as a vaginal microbicide. I mentioned Erwin Goldstein and his colleague, Harry Winter, uh, experts on glycobiology who got us interested in this project originally. Jeannie Stuckey and Jennifer Mager who did the crystallography and continue to be very important collaborators. Uh, at Rockefeller where uh, a lot of all the hepatitis C work was done that I didn't have time to show you too much of but can be summarized as 
H84T works against all different sorts of strains of hepatitis C, led by Charlie Rice, and then also Cynthia de la Fuente, uh, Hans uh, Heinrich uh, Hoffman. And then uh, our collaborators on all of the live influenza work are Bart, Tar Bart uh, Tarbot, Don Smee, and Brett Hurst at Utah State University. Elka Lipka is a very important collaborator, helping us to try to develop H84T uh, BANLAC as a potential commercially and clinically viable molecule. Uh, let's see, Dominique I've mentioned at Leuven, who's been a really important collaborator on uh, testing H84T against a bunch of different viruses, but especially HIV. Hanso Akim Gabias is a great collaborator who I, 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 I told uh, Mauro today I haven't actually met person to person yet, but uh, he's been uh, vital uh, because he's an actual expert on glycobiology. So he's been really important to this work, as is his collaborators, Sabid Andre, Paul Murphy, Stefan Oskarsson, and Rene Roy. And I mentioned Jasper Chan, who's our um, collaborator on the uh, MERS part of this uh, project. Uh, and as all projects, uh, financing is important. We've actually uh, got a long, long way into this project before we ever got any money to fund it. Uh, it was all funded through uh, triangulation of money and uh, also through uh, some money from the NIH to do some of the uh, contract work. But now there's funding through MTRAC, which is a University of Michigan internal uh, program to help commercialize things. Through DITRA, which is actually the Army, which funds the Ebola work, uh, and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases through contracts uh, for testing the uh, flu part. And originally, the money came really from the office of the director. We had what's called a transformative R01, which was a very large grant to study endogenous retroviruses. And we were doing that with uh, Hashem. And then the one thing led to another. And that uh, supported a lot of the uh, work on this project before it had its own uh, initial funding. So uh, with that, I close. I thank you very much for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer questions if there's time. So.